The conflict would wreck the Taiwanese economy. It's important to note, too, that the Chinese suffer heavily. The losses and the fact of defeat might be enough to destabilize the Chinese communist regime. So they are betting their future on any invasion also. There is no Ukraine option for Taiwan. Hey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching if you're over on YouTube. My guest today is retired Marine Colonel Mark Cancia. He is currently a senior advisor for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We're going to kick the conversation off today with a Chinese invasion of Taiwan and what that might look like. He and his co-authors war gamed out. This is the largest war game, unclassified war game of what it might look like if China decided ever to invade Taiwan. We don't talk about the probability, and that's not what the study is about, but I have that link down below. We also jump into the discussion about Ukraine, F-16s for Ukraine, and the Israel-Hamas conflict. He's written articles and papers on all those, which I have linked down below. As always, shout out to my patrons for supporting the podcast. If you're interested in There I Was stories, those now specifically live over on Patreon, as well as Apple. Spotify is no longer a thing when it comes to There I Was stories. So if you're interested in those, if you're interested in supporting the podcast, feel free to jump over to Patreon and join in the fight or subscribe over on Apple Podcasts. If that's not your thing and you're getting value out of this, a big shout out to all those who take the time to leave a rating or review over on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. But following the show, that makes sure you get up to date when the podcast releases and it also helps the podcast get shown to more people because it shows more followers standard algorithm stuff but again if you're getting value out of this content please take just a few seconds to make sure you're following the show both on apple and spotify that really helps me out and if you want a ROI story jump over to patreon with that being said i think we've hit all our admin notes so let's jump into the podcast Sir, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Uh, happy to have you here and excited to kind of dig into some of the topics we're going to talk about, which is going to be China, Ukraine, Israel, and just hit a, a few highlights here. So again, thank you for joining me on the podcast. Over 30 years, the United States Marine Corps, both active and reserve, tours in Vietnam, Iraq. Uh, you've also worked a lot throughout the Department of Defense, uh, both in the military, obviously, capacity, but in the civilian capacity in the Department of Energy as well. I'm sure I'm missing a few things. Is there anything else you think we should highlight? The only thing I would add is that I'm now at a think tank, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, where I I'm a senior advisor, and I write about military forces and operations. That's really where I uh, came about, and I found you, which you had an interesting study where you had some war games with the Chinese invasion or potential Chinese invasion of Taiwan and how that might play out uh, in the region, how the United States, how their allies would be impacted, obviously how the Taiwan and China would be impacted as well. And again, that's really where I'd like to kick this off. What was the impetus of doing the war games? What was the reason behind going through this effort to put forth? Well, there are a couple of reasons. Uh, one, of course, is that this is a topic that has received a tremendous amount of attention. The Department of Defense says that China is the pacing threat, and there's been a lot of attention to Taiwan, particularly because of rising Chinese rhetoric and its military buildup. That doesn't mean an invasion or an attack is imminent or even likely, but it certainly is plausible. But there were a couple of other reasons that we started this project. One was that there's very little in the unclassified space about a conflict between the U.S. and China over Taiwan. The Department of Defense has done a lot of war games internally, but those are classified. Little bits and pieces come out. Those are fragmentary, and frankly, some of them are self-serving. Uh, we also wanted to do a war game many times. Uh, there are war games that have been done in various think tanks, and a lot of them are very well done and very interesting, but they're done once or twice. And that can be very educational for the people involved, but it's not a very strong foundation for making recommendations for policy. So we wanted to do 
20 iterations. We ended up doing 25. And finally, we wanted to base the game on objective data, not uh, a group of subject matter experts in the back room who were making judgments about you know, whether cruise missiles could get through um, uh, defenses. So we did a lot of operations research and uh, historical research to come up with tables that we thought were uh, as objective as possible. So the three things, well, the four things really, hot topic, the need for unclassified insights, multiple iterations, uh, and finally, uh, objective analysis. I should mention too, uh, this obviously this the war game report, which is a 165 page report link down below for those who want to go read it and, and dig a little bit further into it. It's a it's a great report. Can you talk to me about how actually physically the war game was structured, some of the assumptions that went into it? How was it built and how was it executed? It's important to note that the there were three authors. I am one it, was three equal offers, a tr authors, a, a triumvirate. Uh, another uh, author is a fellow named Eric Hagenbotham. He runs a wargaming center up at MIT and came out of RAND, did a lot of work on uh, Chinese military forces. He speaks Japanese and Mandarin. Uh, and the third is Matthew Kansian, who runs war games at the Naval War College and has a PhD from MIT, and many people will note that there's a similarity between my name and his, uh, and he is, in <laughs> fact, my younger son. Uh, and that's why actually the game got started, because uh, he and Eric were doing sort of a, a crude version of the war game for uh, a foundation, and they were running it once or twice, and Matthew and I would talk about how they were doing it, and that's when we got the idea that instead of running it once or twice and, you know, with a so a prototype, you know, that we would apply for a grant to refine the game and then run it many times. And so we, we did that. The Smith Richardson Foundation uh, gave us some money to do that, and that's where the uh, the game came from. We, we launched that about, uh, oh, it's two years ago now, and uh, and then finally finished it, uh, published the results in January of 2023. Now, the the study or the report, obviously, it, it highlights the fact that you're not in uh, predicting the probability that China would invade Taiwan. It's purely if it did happen, how it might play out. But you did pick the year 2026, if I read correctly. Is there a reason why you picked 2026 for the year that China could possibly invade Taiwan? Yeah, uh, and then it's important to reinforce the point that you just made, which is we are not saying that an invasion is likely. Uh, we are arguing, though, that it is plausible, given the aggressive rhetoric of the Chinese leadership and the military buildup, uh, plus the fact that an invasion would be the most dangerous course of action for the Chinese. We looked at that first. And then for 2026, what was the, I mean, I guess, what was the rationale behind picking picking that year? We picked 2026 for two reasons. One is that that was inside what's now known as the Davidson window. Uh, this is named for Admiral Davidson, who was commander of Indo-PACOM. And he said that the period, sort of 2026, 2028, was a time of great danger because the Chinese buildup was continuing, but new U.S. capabilities would not be online at that, at that, at that point. 2026 at the time was also the end of the Pentagon's planning period. It's what's called its future year uh, defense program. So we had a pretty good sense about what, what U.S. capabilities would be. So for both reasons, we picked 2026. Okay. Can you talk to me, what would the invasion most likely look like based upon the wargaming that you guys executed? We hypothesized that the Chinese would launch a surprise attack. The United States would see it about 15 days out, and the Chinese would be would take about 30 days to prepare their forces. We would see it 15 days out. Uh, the United States would take some precautions, move forces into the Western Pacific, increase the readiness of forces back home, but not execute a full uh, tipfid. Uh, the Chinese would begin with a 
massive missile strike against U.S. forces uh, in the Pacific and against uh, Taiwan, and then launch its landing forces uh, and its fleet uh, to protect it. A key assumption is about Japan. The war game has about 20 assumptions, and we varied many of them, but one of the key ones was Japan. Our base case, which is the most likely in our opinion, was that the Japanese would allow the United States to use its bases in Japan, for example, Kadena Air Force Base on Okinawa, but would not participate itself unless it were attacked by the Chinese. Now, in about 19 of the 25 iterations that we ran, the Chinese did attack J Japan, so Japan did come into the conflict. But the reason we took that as a base assumption is twofold. First, we tested it with many senior Japanese officials, and they were quite confident with it. They argued two things. First, that this was the path of least resistance for the Japanese. In other words, if they did nothing, that's what ha would happen. The United States would use these bases because we've stated our intention to do that, uh, but they would not become involved. But the other reason they said was that if Japan did not allow the United States to use its bases, it would be, in effect, tearing up its security relationship with the United States, which had safeguarded Japan for 70 years. And they believed that no Japanese government would be willing to do that. So for both reasons, uh, we started with that assumption. We did run an excursion where the Japanese were entirely neutral. And that is very difficult for the United States. One of our insights was that the United States has to have access to bases in Japan because that's the only way we can get our TAC air into the fight. Guam is too far away for TAC air. Uh, it can be used for bombers, although it's still inside the uh, Chinese uh, missile defensive zone. Uh, but if we can't use the bases in Japan, then you know, all those F-35s and F-15s and F-16s just... Uh, are useless because we there's no place to base them. Uh, the United States has to fight entirely with essentially submarines and bombers with long-range missiles, and that's just not enough. That's one of the scenarios where the United States and its allies lose. Obviously, this is an unclassified report, and there are assumptions being made uh, upon you know capabilities. Can you talk to me about what those assumptions would be? You know, if the if you're comparing 100 F-35s to the Chinese, the the PLA, their air force. Is it just a probability table of 60 to 40 percent? Or what were some of those assumptions as far as the effectiveness of the different weapons? Yeah. Yeah, we used uh, a lot of uh, testing data to uh, assess whether, you know, what the effectiveness of all the different aircraft were. And of course, U.S. fifth generation aircraft are uh, very effective. Uh, the interesting thing is that there was not that much air-to-air -air combat. Uh, and of course, you know, there's a lot of attention on that. You know, can an F-35 or an F-22 take on the uh, latest Chinese uh, fighters? And those are important questions. But the uh, on the U.S. side, the major focus was on striking the Chinese fleet. So there was a, a lot of use of TAC air to launch long-range missiles uh, in addition to escorting strike packages. A key insight about aviation was that 90% of U.S. and coalition aircraft losses were on the ground because the Chinese missile inventory is just so large that periodically they would sweep all of the air bases in theater and destroy dozens and sometimes even hundreds of U.S. and coalition aircraft on the ground. One of the questions we raised was the the value of expensive fighter aircraft. If you're going to lose 90% of them on the ground, you know, is it worth investing $200 million per aircraft for a sixth gen uh, uh, fighter? Now, we don't answer that question, but we did want to raise that question. We also argued very strongly that the United States needed to do two things to protect its tech air. One was dispersion, which the Air Force is doing a lot of. Uh, the other thing was hardening uh, shelters, uh, which the United States is not doing a lot of. And 
needs needs to reinstitute. We did a lot of it during the Cold War, uh, because otherwise aircraft are just standing out in the open and very exposed to these Chinese missile attacks. Korea being one of those examples of hazes, hardened aircraft shelters where those are in place, but elsewhere those don't really exist. And you alluded to the dispersion of forces. We've talked on the podcast and other episodes about the ACE, the Agile Combat uh, Employment that's going on through the Air Force. Can you talk to, did that play any factor into the scenarios of how the Air Force is trying to disperse forces across the Pacific? It did. And, and to start with the hardened aircraft shelters, the United States has uh, some in Korea, of course, but basically we stopped building those with the end of the Cold War and haven't built any since. Uh, there are none on Anderson Air Force Base on Guam, despite the fact that Chinese missiles can now strike Anderson. So if the United States is going to use Anderson in a conflict with China, we've, we've got to do something. Uh, and Harden Shell just makes a lot of sense. Uh, on the question of dispersion, yes, we did play dispersion. We had disperse, dispersal bases, um, and and that helps. There are two th cautions, though. I mean, one is that we need the ability to disperse to civilian airfields because they are already e equipped to handle large numbers of aircraft and being able to use them then you, means you don't have to bring in as much in infrastructure. The other thing is that there's a lot of interest in you know, taking small groups of aircraft, six aircraft, and putting them in very remote uh, airfields, maybe very austere airfields. And that is not really very helpful because the problem the United States faces is you have to find bed down for hundreds of airplanes and spreading them around in around the Pacific in groups of six or 12 doesn't get you very far and is an immense logistics burden. So yes, dispersal is important, uh, but we need to think of ways to do it with large numbers of aircraft and leverage civilian capabilities more aggressively. Another aspect of the study that you released, the fifth gen fighter, the J-20 of the PLA. Engine technology is, again, something we've talked about on the podcast. Engine technology, I think, makes or breaks a military. The PLA, the Chinese have a tough time with engine technology. So uh, again, I know there's some assumptions there if you want to speak to that, but one thing that stood out to me was the fact that, again, we have to remember that 100 miles from China sits Taiwan. But for the United States to get into place, to be able to support it, the Pacific Ocean is a vast, vast body of water with a lot of distance to cover to be able to reinforce, to be able to support, et cetera. Can you talk about some of those aspects? I'm, I'm going to have to defer on the engine technology. My colleague, Eric Hegenbotham, is the expert on that one. Uh, but there's no question about the tyranny of distance in the Pacific. And it's something that is difficult to appreciate when we've spent so much time focusing on Europe and the Middle East where distances are not so great. In the Pacific, the United States has this tremendous problem about just getting into the fight. Even uh, aircraft stationed in southern Japan, the mainland islands, still quite a ways from Taiwan, whereas the Chinese are right offshore. And what that means is that the Chinese can spend a lot more time over the island, either combat air patrols or for close air support, uh, uh, as opposed to the United States and Japan, you know, which can get over the island, but uh, it just takes longer and they can't have as much presence there. So that's a tremendous challenge to the U.S. and coalition side. Can you talk to me about uh, what the war game produced? What is there a, a common theme with the end result of the war game? The major finding of the war game was that the United States and its coalition partners could maintain an autonomous and democratic Taiwan, but it comes at very high cost, a cost that would take many years to replace and might damage U.S global position for many years, even decades. The conflict would wreck the 
Taiwanese economy. It's important to note, too, that the Chinese suffer heavily, and the losses and the fact of defeat might be enough to destabilize the Chinese communist regime. So they are betting their future on any invasion also. And I know we, sh we should mention too, right? Again, we're solely digging into war games. I think some things have happened in the news in the last six months that could be contributing factors, but we're not going to speak to that today. And again, I brought it up on other podcasts with uh, President Xi firing a lot of his military. There's a lot of corruption and, and ties to missile tech or missile techs, missiles being filled with water, et cetera. Um, and again, those obviously would have be factors like anything else when it came to a conflict, but we're not digging into that today. Out of this, is there anything, what are the, the big bedrocks for the United States military, for allies, as far as preparation and recommendations in the event that an invasion is imminent or an invasion occurs? Well, a key finding is that Although the United States is able to prevail, uh, it, it's worth enhancing deterrence so we never have to fight this conflict and strengthening forces so that if a conflict does come, we can bring it to a conclusion more rapidly and with lower losses. We did have some people look at the results and say, hey, we won. What's the big deal? And our point is, no, the losses are so great, we need to avoid uh, this kind of conflict. There were a couple of other big insights also. One was about how important Japan is. As we discussed, the United States can't get its TAC air into the fight unless we can base these forces in Japan. Guam is just too far away. You know, in theory, with enough tanking, you can get a aircraft from Guam over Taiwan, but you can't do that day after day with whole squadrons. In theory, we might use the Philippines, and that's possible. Although the Philippines have said that they won't do that for a conflict over Taiwan. They're very focused on the South China Sea. The United States has received basing rights or has had basing agreements for nine uh, bases in the Philippines. Most of those are oriented on the South China Sea, although a couple of them could be used in a conflict with Taiwan. And we did have uh, excursions that uh, allowed the United States uh, to to do that, uh, but I say politically uh, very uncertain. Another major insight was that there is no Ukraine option for Taiwan. With Ukraine, of course, the United States and allies have sent munitions and weapons into Ukraine after the war began. That Russians have tried to interdict that flow, but have been unable to do that. That's not possible with Taiwan. The Chinese defensive bubble over Taiwan is so strong that you can't get anything in there for at least a month or two. In the games, we had several players who tried to do that. They tried to sail, for example, one of the uh, Marine Littoral Regiments onto Taiwan. Uh, that uh, uh, convoy was always sunk. One team tried to fly uh, some reinforcements onto the island. Uh, the C-17s were all shot down. So, Taiwan has to start the war with everything it needs for at least the first uh, month or two. Another major insight was the importance of munitions inventories. And these have been getting a lot of attention recently because of shortages as a result of the war in Ukraine and U.S. deliveries to Ukraine. Our war game also contributed to that discussion. We found that some major elements of uh, U.S. missile capability, long-range anti-ship missiles, uh, run out in the first couple of days. So uh, the United States needs to expand those inventories. Uh, and the Pentagon's doing that, uh, but it's going to take many years. An additional insight is how different a great power conflict will be from the experience of the last 25 years when the United States has fought counterinsurgencies and regional conflicts. The leadership in the Pentagon, the service chiefs, recognize how different it's going to be. And they've stated many times about demands of a great power conflict, and they're trying to reorient their force structures. The problem is that the lived experience of the mid-level officers uh, who have been in these regional conflicts 
is very different from what we would experience in a great power conflict. I think this is particularly true for the Air Force and the Navy, which for the last 25 years at least have operated essentially in sanctuary. Uh, adversaries have not been able to get at our fleet and not been able to get at our air bases. The example I use is follow-on forces that land at Kadena Air Force Base on Okinawa. These follow-on aircraft will land on a runway that's very bumpy because it has been patched so many times after Chinese missile attacks. They're going to taxi past literally hundreds of wrecked aircraft that were destroyed on the ground. They're going to move into a barracks that was vacated by the previous squadron because they were all killed in the previous missile attacks. The hospital is going to be full of wounded. The golf course will have been turned into a cemetery, and they will be told, welcome to Okinawa tomorrow, you fly over Taiwan. And that is an experience the Air Force has not had since arguably 1944. Yeah, I think probably the fair statement is World War III um, that, that kicks off. You mentioned in the, in the war game, or you war gamed as well. Can you talk to me about the civilian aspect of it? Because you alluded to there might there were scenarios where the Chinese uh, would send a submarine off the West Coast targeting U.S. cities. Can you talk to the aspect of the civilian impact and how that might affect the scenario? We wrestled a lot with uh, Chinese capabilities and you know, the notion of sending a submarine to the U.S. West Coast. Uh, we had some players who were very imaginative and hypothesized various kinds of cyber attacks, uh, even uh, special operations attacks on U.S. leadership. Uh, we finally decided to limit capabilities to, to demonstrated demonstrate. capabilities. You know, that is, if the Chinese or the U.S. had shown the ability to conduct certain operations, that we put those in the game. Uh, if they had not, then we didn't. And we recognize that there's some risk of surprise, but otherwise you know, people come up with all kinds of you know, interesting possibilities that uh, that either side would be uh, really unable uh, to do. So uh, in this case, the Chinese submarines were mostly wrapped up with operations in the Western Pacific. And in fact, we see this across the board. That is, the conflict is so intense that neither side has a lot of capability to divert it to other uh, goals. Uh, with the Chinese, of course, they're desperately trying to save their amphibious ships. Uh, with the United States, we're trying to attack the amphibious ships. And I would note that the amphibious ships, Chinese amphibious ships, are the center of gravity for the campaign. Uh, some U.S. teams thought about conducting a deep attack on the Chinese mainland, uh, strategic attack campaigns against infrastructure and uh, political institutions, but they quickly found that they just didn't have enough capability to do that, which might have effect, but take weeks or arguably months uh, when the Chinese were landing troops on Taiwan and attacking U.S. forces. So the, the struggle around Taiwan really absorbs all of the military attention for both sides. We did talk to it earlier, the 100 miles you have to cross. It's still 100 miles, not an easy thing to do. When it comes to the assumptions of capabilities of the Chinese being able to cross the Taiwan Strait in large numbers, how did that fit into the war games? For all military forces, we assumed as the base case that they could execute the missions for which they were designed. So for the Chinese, that meant that they could use their amphibious capabilities for which they had built uh, ships. Uh, same for the Taiwanese and the Japanese, as well as the United, the United States. Uh, even with those capabilities, which were quite robust, and that assumed that the uh, very high level of Chinese capability for joint operations and amphibious operations, even then they struggled to get forces ashore and then sustain them. Logistics turned out to be uh, a huge problem. We ran some excursions where the Chinese were not 
as skilled in joint operations and amphibious operations. And, and in those situations, they lost very quickly because, of course, the whole campaign focuses on their ability to uh, do both of those. I would like to segue, because you've written about Ukraine, you've written about Israel, but to segue between the two, with the war gaming in the report, you do talk about parallels between Ukraine and China and Taiwan. Can you talk about what those parallels are and what they what are not paralleled? There are a few important parallels. I think the big one is bad things happen. Before the invasion of Ukraine, most commentators, myself included, just couldn't believe that a country in the 21st century would invade a neighboring country and then try to conquer it. But in fact, that's what the Russians did. Some years ago, I wrote a report on uh, what I called coping with surprise. And one of the points I made was that bad things happen, unexpected things happen. Uh, countries will weigh military decisions in a way that we think are unwise or misplaced, but they will do that anyway. Maybe their uh, assumptions about military capability are different from ours. Maybe their assumptions about changing military balance is different from ours and they feel that they have to move now. But for whatever reason, surprises, attacks happen. Of course, one of the classic examples there is Japan attacking the United States in 1941. The United States had done its analysis and thought that this would be a very foolish thing for the Japanese to do. Uh, and we were right. But they did it anyway. And the Japanese had done the same analysis. They weren't under a lot of illusions about their ability to defeat the United States. They uh, intended to strike the United States hard enough that we got discouraged, but they recognized the risks also but decided that the risks were worthwhile given the squeeze that was being put on the Japanese economy. So if I had to pick a one major insight you know, that comes out of Ukraine is bad things happen. And if the, if the Chinese were to invade Taiwan tomorrow, no one would get up and say, wow, didn't see that coming. No, everybody would say, oh yeah, we've been expecting that for a long time. So it's important then to be uh, ready for that kind of situation. A couple of other things come out of the uh, war in Ukraine. And it's important to note one of the big differences, the war in Ukraine is primarily a ground war, whereas a uh, conflict with China over Taiwan would be mostly uh, air and naval. Uh, and that has actually been quite beneficial because it means that much of the aid that we have sent to Ukraine would either not be useful or not be as critical in a conflict in the Western Pacific. So there's some trade-off there, but not as much as uh, might otherwise be the case. One thing that does come out uh, looking at the war in Ukraine is first the need for adaptation. That is, unexpected things happen and uh, you have to be ready to adapt when you know, your expectations uh, are not met. Yet both sides are doing that. Uh, I think uh, before the war, if you had asked people, what do you think the role of trench lines, fortifications, and unguided, utility, unguided artillery will be in the next war? Uh, many Washington experts would say, those are irrelevant. You know, modern warfare is long range, precision strikes, small units operating autonomously. And of course, what we've seen is entirely the opposite. You know, it looks like World War I with some 21st century uh, weapons. And both sides have adapted to that. And that doesn't mean that new capabilities are not important. Of course, anti-tank weapons uh, like Javelin and Enlos have been very uh, important. And drones have been hugely important as uh, ISR and as ways to direct artillery. Another surprise has been the strength of air defenses. We're not sure how that will affect a conflict in the Western Pacific, but certainly over Ukraine, the air defenses on both sides have been so great, it's difficult for aircraft to fly over the territory of the other side. In fact, you almost never see that anymore. 
aircraft uh, either just go right over the front lines, drop their ordnance in, in scoots, or they fire longer range uh, munitions to stay out of air defense envelopes. So you're seeing air defenses have a real impact on manned aircraft. One thing that's been very interesting is on the naval side, the Ukrainians have defeated the Russian Navy, driven them to the corners of the Black Sea without any of the attributes of a Navy. They don't have any ships and they don't have any naval aircraft. They've been able to do that with long range precision strike, both anti-ship missiles, and that's what sank the Moskva, uh, land attack missiles, which have attacked Russian ships at the pier, uh, and then unmanned surface vessels uh, that have tracked down, hunted uh, Russian ships in their anchorages. So non-traditional capabilities at sea have been unexpectedly effective. How that affects a conflict in the Western Pacific, people are going to be thinking about for many years, but it's been a very striking aspect of the conflict. And finally, you know, for air attack, the use of long-range drones, uh, cruise missiles, but, but the kind of kamikaze drones that Iran has supplied to Russia have supplanted strikes by manned aircraft. We don't know if that's going to be the case in the Western Pacific, but it's very striking that the air war is very active. Uh, attacks against deep targets and cities are an integral part of the conflict, but it's not being done in the way that has been done in the past. It is interesting to see how things have been shaping up, in particular, if we just with current times and the Houthis. Red Sea, what off-the-shelf technology, Ukraine off-the-shelf technology, you see these farms where they're 3D printing drones and just how these non-traditional means that have popped up, how they're impacting the battle space. And I can only imagine that, you know, we, we what, what would transpire if we actually went into a conflict? Of course, the drones are a striking aspect of the conflict in Ukraine and both sides, everyone is thinking about how that would affect conflicts elsewhere, for example, in the Western Pacific. Now, the situation there is different in the sense that it's air and naval. Most of the drones that are used in Ukraine are these small, cheap, uh, expendable drones that are used either for ISR or you know have some small uh, ordnance on them and you know, used against you know, personnel targets or vehicles. We have not seen much use of the the large drones like Predators, Reapers that were so important in the Middle East wars. How that translates to the Western Pacific again is a little uncertain. You know our timeline which was 2026, didn't allow for many of those capabilities to be fielded. For example, the Navy is looking at a lot of unmanned surface vessels, underwater vessels. Those might start to be uh, fielded operationally by 2026. They're doing a lot of experimentation now. Air Force is running a lot of experiments with what they call loyal wingmen, uh, again, it's not quite, those are experiments, uh, but you can see that those capabilities are on the verge of being fielded and making a major difference. And if there were a conflict, then you, you would see these capabilities pushed into the conflict as we've seen it in, in Ukraine, where we would be willing to experiment, take losses, uh, you know, and pay the cost of putting immature technologies uh, out into the field uh, if we thought that it would have a uh, immediate uh, effect during a conflict where you're struggling to get any military advantage. I would like to dig a little bit more into Ukraine, get your take, um, maybe specifically pitch towards the F-16 and the fact that they're getting them. Full disclosure, I've been a skeptic of Ukraine getting F-16s just from a, the training aspect, the logistical support aspect, 
runways, training maintainers, et cetera. But curious to get uh, your take on, let's talk specifically the F-16 going to Ukraine. Well, I think we're in the same <laughs> place. That is, uh, many people have uh, noted the failure of the Ukrainian counteroffensive and have hypothesized that they uh, air superiority to strike the Russian forces and protect uh, Ukrainian forces. And then they say, therefore, we need F-16s. And when we get F-16s, then we can uh, launch another counteroffensive with air uh, superiority. And I think it's important to recognize that that's not going to happen for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that just not enough F-16s. They're talking about 12 or 24 when you're facing Russian uh, air power that's got as hundreds of, of aircraft and, of course, a very strong uh, air defense environment. Plus, the Ukrainians just aren't going to have the auxiliary capabilities in terms of aerial uh, warning, uh, in terms of munitions, uh, in terms of support aircraft, you know, that really are needed to go downtown, you know, and to be survivable in high uh, threat areas. So F-16, huge uh, psychological impact, huge symbolic impact, not going to make a big difference uh, on the battlefield. But that doesn't mean that the Ukrainians need to give up on uh, uh, the air domain. They could do in the air what they've done at sea, which is to use non-traditional tools to assert at least local air dominance. And what would be non-traditional tools? Of course, these would be uh, strikes against you know, Russian uh, bases. These would be long-range anti-air uh, missile capabilities. This would be more drones uh, with anti-air missile capabilities. Um, and uh, probably more ground-based area defenses uh, that as a package would be able to at least nullify, if not actually implement air superiority over parts of the battlefield. So air will continue to be important, uh, but it's not going to be conducted in the way that we have become accustomed a over the last, you know, arguably hundred years. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, Again, those, I think the morale boost, the support aspect, you know, depending not to be political, right? There, there are people obviously for the support and there are people against it. Um, but I can see that advantageous if you want to support morally and give a, a boost, you, hey, here's some really cool jets. The greatest fighter ever created by man, the F-16. But um, it is a very robust IADS you're having to deal with. You're, you know, you're learning a new Western jet albeit doing training here, but to go and actually fly and fight in a hostile environment on day one, basically. And it takes years to build that experience as a pilot to know how to best employ that aircraft. And that's completely skipping over, I think, the most important fact, the maintainers. That jet you know, needs a lot of maintenance and a lot of know-how in order to fix it. And you're having to learn uh, a very complex system in a very challenging environment. Um, so, yeah, that, yeah, and that's that's absolutely true. And and you know the psychological, political impact is important. Uh, it's I think it's also important to emphasize that there's no such thing as a game changing weapon. You know, from the beginning of the conflict, people have been pointing to certain weapons as game changers. And I talk to journalists a lot, and I get a lot of questions. You know, is this is this weapon going to be a game changer? And initially, it was javelins and then it was high mars then it was patriot then it was m1 tanks and now it's f-16s and I, I make the point there's no such thing as a game changer there's no weapon we can give the ukrainians that will win the war now all of these weapons cumulatively increase ukraine's military capabilities so it's worth sending them but the fact that we're sending some particular piece of equipment is not in itself uh, going to produce victory. And as a follow-on to that, what it means is that the United States and coalition partners need to continue the flow of military aid to Ukraine across the board 
in order for Ukrainian resistance to continue. So it's not as important that we send any particular piece of equipment. It's important that we continue to send a wide variety of equipment and lots of it so the Ukrainians can continue that. Resistance. What is the importance, in your opinion, of that resistance? Because again, we go back to, you know, I think now there's two camps, right? They're either for it and support the Ukrainians or, hey, it's not my problem, not my fight. Um, what What's the take on that? I think it's important to keep a couple of things in mind. Uh, one is that the Ukrainians are uh, fighting this war themselves. They are not asking for any U.S. troops. There are no U.S. troops involved. Uh, this is very different from Iraq and Afghanistan, where U.S. troops are involved and fighting and dying, frankly. Uh, that's not true here. They are just asking for the tools to defend themselves. The second thing is that the second thing is that the cost is not very high when you consider it in respect to the U.S. defense budget and the U.S. federal budget. Uh, it's about we've spent about one hundred and thirteen billion dollars. Over the two years, we've spent about $1.6 trillion on uh, defense. So you can do the math. It's about 8% then. And that $113 billion, that includes not just military support, but uh, humanitarian support, economic support, uh, a variety of elements. So Compared to the federal budget, which I think is $6 trillion, I mean, it's it's very, very small. So the fiscal burden is very modest. What we're getting is the weakening of a major threat to Europe and the U.S. alliance of NATO. No matter what happens, the Russians are going to be quite weakened when they come out of this fight. The... Biden administration, as well as the Trump administration and the Obama administration, had identified Russia, Russia as a, a major threat to the United States. So for a very small cost, we are uh, weakening that threat and not losing any U.S. troops uh, in the process. And it's important to keep in mind that, again, no matter how this war comes out, you're still going to have a hostile Russia on the other end. The Russian hostility to the United States and Europe and NATO goes very deep. And it goes not just in the Putin regime, it goes back centuries and millennia. Regime is uh, revanchist, you know, that is, it wants to expand. It believes that it has a right to certain uh, territories outside its borders, for example, the, the Baltic countries. So even if the United States cuts off aid and Ukraine is defeated, uh, the threat is still going to be there. The, the Russians will just be a little closer and then be able to threaten NATO where we have uh, a security alliance. Can we pivot to Israel? And again, you've written uh, on Israel, the Hamas war that's been going on. Can I get a broad brush take on that? And then maybe we dive into some of the aspects of that. Well, the war in the Middle East, of course, has been very brutal. It began with this massacre of Israelis. And now the Israelis are hammering Gaza with a lot of uh, casualties, a lot of civilian uh, suffering there. What's been interesting is that it is so heavily a war of precision munitions, whether launched from aircraft or helicopters or from uh, the ground. They're uh, the Israelis are, are doing that for a variety of reasons. One, it's you know it's much more effective, uh, saves their own troops, and it also uh, reduces civilian casualties. Although there's no way to take those casualties to zero, the civilians are always going to uh, suffer uh, tremendously. There were a couple of times during this campaign I thought the Israelis might stop, but from the beginning they have said that they intend to destroy Hamas and. That is what they are. That's what they are doing, and I expect that they will move into the last stronghold of Hamas, Rafa, uh, at some point. Just talk about a deal of some sort. Uh, I think that this will not be a permanent settlement or even a, a major settlement. I think it'll be another 
exchange of some hostages for some prisoners and a ceasefire for a limited period of time. Otherwise, the, the two sides just don't have any common ground. Israel wants to destroy Hamas and get its hostages back. The Hamas wants Israel out of the Gaza Strip, uh, which they would regard as a victory because that would leave them in control of the Gaza Strip and they would claim that they defeated Israel and you know kill, kill a lot of Jews and are still there. So I don't see uh, a permanent negotiation, a permanent settlement yet. I do see that some sort of uh, interim settlement. Another question that rise, arises is trade-offs of support among Israel, Ukraine, and Taiwan. And there are some trade-offs. Now, Ukraine is by far the largest recipient of aid. Uh, Israel has been receiving some elements, uh, particularly uh, precision munitions, for example, some artillery, uh, some air defense, mostly things that Ukraine does not need, although there is some overlap, drones and artillery ammunition. Taiwan can use some of the items that are being sent to Ukraine and Israel, particularly the Taiwanese want to strengthen their ground forces. Uh, but because they are not in an immediate conflict, they're sort of third in, in line. Some of the things that they are receiving, Harpoon missiles, for example, uh, aren't needed by either Israel or Ukraine, and those uh, can continue to flow. So there is some trade-off uh, among them, uh, but fortunately not severe at this point. So talking of all three of those, uh, this is obviously outside the scope of the, the war game study we initiated or the discussion with. But when we look at supporting all these entities, if a major conflict did kick off with Taiwan and you still have conflict going off in Europe and the Middle East, is there a breaking point for the United States military, for the United States budget? Where Where is the point that we can no longer support all of these or does that exist? Well, there are two questions in there. One is, can we support these three uh, allies coalition partners who face existential threats in peacetime? And the answer to that is yes. I know that there are some trade-offs for support that we're providing, uh, but so far they are severe. The United States has sent a lot of equipment, particularly to Ukraine. Now, Congress provided money to replace all of that, but it will take a couple of years for that, that new production uh, to be received by U.S. forces. So there is a gap. There is some risk in that uh, gap. There are some advantages, too, in, in that the United States forces will be getting new equipment and they'll be getting the most up-to-date equipment. Uh, the munitions will be at the beginning of their uh, lifetime. They won't be uh, facing uh, expiration. So arguably, when all of this is delivered, U.S. forces will be in better shape, but there is this uh, gap. If there's a war, whole different situation. Uh, a conflict with China would take really almost all of U.S. forces. Uh, in our war game, we assumed that uh, we would pull out all of the forces in CONUS, continental United States, many of the forces overseas. Uh, the only two places where we left forces were ground forces in Korea and ground forces and a little air power in Europe, but everything else has to flow. So if a conflict with China broke out tomorrow, the United States would have to pull back its forces in the Middle East and its forces in Europe, turn those theaters over to our allies. With China and actually Afghanistan, had we remained or had a presence stayed uh, stay behind in Afghanistan, would that have threatened China or at least made them look towards the their western flank? Is that something that's been looked at from a strategic standpoint? I don't think that leaving forces in Afghanistan would have diverted uh, the Chinese. They don't have any military forces 
aimed in the direction of Afghanistan, and we certainly couldn't have threatened uh, their western flank, uh, what would have happened is that there would not have been this precipitous, chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan that raised questions about U.S. Um, uh, staying power. Uh, it's the same question we're facing in Ukraine. And certainly if we pull out of Ukraine, having already done that in Afghanistan, there are going to be a lot of countries, uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, plus the Philippines and many other countries in the Western Pacific who are going to be wondering, you know, can we count on the United States? If a war breaks out, are they going to decide that it's just not worth it and, you know, pull their forces away after uh, some period of time? So, it's uh, it's not a military threat uh, with Afghanistan. It is the question about U.S. Uh, willingness to uh, endure a conflict. Well, sir, before we wrap up here, I'd like to ask is for those listening, for those watching, are there specific takeaways or things, questions people should be asking? They should be thinking about uh, as we march, you know, march through this decade um, with all the conflict and potential conflict that that exists out there. There are a couple of things that I would suggest people think about. The first is, as we talked about in our uh, discussion, bad things can happen. Surprises can happen. So even though people may believe that a Chinese attack on Taiwan is uh, unwise, it could certainly occur. And we need to be ready for that. We need to have forces that can deter and, if necessary, fight a conflict like that. When we look at Europe, the United States is committed to European security through NATO. That has been hugely successful. And unfortunately, the Europeans have shown that they are unable to organize themselves without U.S. leadership. Without the U.S., they mill about, uh, despite having strong militaries and very powerful economies. They need U.S. leadership. We saw that uh, during the war in Ukraine. And in the Middle East, we can see that, again, bad things happen, and the United States is not going to be able to withdraw the way some experts had recommended uh, before the uh, current hostilities. So many people have looked at the Middle East and said, you know, we ought to you know, pull our forces back. This is a place where we can uh, take some risk. And unfortunately, global events have a way of reminding us that Global superpowers have global commitments and can't just walk away from them. So uh, all three of these areas have potential uh, dangers, uh, but they are manageable with our allies if we are willing to make the investments. And I would, as a summary comment, note that these investments as a U.S. global superpower have paid off hugely. That is, they have safeguarded the U.S. economy, U.S. society. Uh, they have allowed us to become a wealthy nation. And if we step back from those commitments, my fear is not is that things would not continue as they are, but without the U.S. Uh, presence and costs, but that there would be a fundamental reorientation of the global relations that the Chinese would step in and they would have a global structure that would be very hostile to the United States and that every American would feel not just politically and internationally, but in their pocketbook. Well, sir, I told a fib because you just brought up a good point that I would like to get your opinion on, which with talking about a, a power vacuum or the Chinese, we've seen the Chinese in Africa and now in South America. We talk BRIC countries, but the U.S. dollar having or being the staple of the world economy. What is the threat if the U.S. pulls back, or is you know is it something that is stoppable if the U.S. is not involved in these places when we look with competing near peer countries? and trying to gain influence on the world stage. The Chinese have made no secret of the fact that they want to displace the United States as the global premier power. And if they do that, then the United States is going to experience a lot of uh, bad effects 
and not just politically and diplomatically, but as I say, economically. For example, if the uh, Chinese currency replaces the United States as the world's basis con currency, then the world might not be buying all of our debt. And if the world doesn't buy our debt, then our, um, uh, we're going to have a hard time with you know, government programs. And that's one thing, defense. But if you're uh, receiving Social Security or plan on receiving Social Security, well, you know, we're financing that with debt. And uh, if the world doesn't buy our debt, you're not getting your Social Security. Uh, so it affects everybody. It's almost like a catch-22. You got to keep spending money and in, in investing in these things in order for the dollar still to be the backbone of the economy. Interesting. Well, sir, again, I appreciate you joining me on the podcast. Down below, I have a link to the study with the war game, and uh, I can provide any other links down there as well. But again, sir, thank you for joining me uh, on the podcast today. Well, thanks for having me on the program.